be live and just you are live now. All right, good evening and welcome to the workshop for the city of Battle Creek, Michigan. Um, to participate in our Zoom meeting, please call the following number 312-626-6799. The caller will be prompted to enter the meeting ID number, which is 947-3184-4389. The caller will be placed in a virtual waiting room until it's time to speak during public comment. At this time, we'll have public comment. Are, are there any callers in the virtual waiting room? Sarah, that would like to speak? We do have jo John Canepin. Okay, John, do you want to speak? Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Good, just a couple comments in regards to this matter. Um, did some of the math in regards to the backup material. Um, a couple of things that sound really kind of nice in regard to the intersection of Emmett Street and North Avenue. It reduces emissions, which is a good thing. That is a good thing. Also, maintaining the signals, they don't have to do anymore because there won't be any signals, so there's a cost savings there. And finally, the electricity that used to be used and currently being used by um, the signal system to make it operate, that would be eliminated by this roundabout. These are all cost savings, and one of the problems here in regards to cost savings is that's a very important thing for the government of Battle Creek to keep the money year after year and not give a reduction of cost to the taxpayers of Battle Creek. Finally, I'm going to give you a cost, excuse me, a cost quote in regard to your backup material. It's one of the further pages of the cost of everything, and the math is two million. The cost of doing this project is two million. $298,700 to do this roundabout. Now, I don't know if you guys are aware of it, but we're in uh, an economic problem within the city of Battle Creek, let alone throughout the country. And when you go and spend, especially from your grants, which are also federal money, or excuse me, state money, federal money, whatever, um, the cost is still from to the taxpayer. Um, this might want to be postponed until we can be in a more financial uh, straightening out our financial situation happening because of the entire or most of the operations of the private sector being shut down. So I would suggest that you, um, this is not a resolution that you're passing at this time. I understand that, but you might want to consider it very carefully, not um, in the future passing this until you're financially back up on your feet, or at least the economy is. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, Sarah, do we have anyone else in the waiting room? He, John Kennevick was our only caller, but we do have a few others in this meeting that are not normally part of our meeting. So if they would like to make public comment. All right, are there any other public comments at this time? Uh, hi, my name is Greg Milliken. I'm a system director of real estate and properties for Bronson Healthcare Group. Um, just introduce myself, Mike Lewis and I are here from Bronson and we're in support of the project and we're happy to answer any questions you may have uh, in regards to this uh, as an adjacent property owner um, and we're just happy that you're uh, reviewing it and looking at this uh, important intersection improvement and just here to voice our support for it so thank you thank you for your comments greg mike do you have something to say Go ahead, Mike, if you have something to say. If not, we'll move on. Okay, I'm gonna give Mike one more chance. Uh, just unmute, unmute yourself and feel free to make your comments. It's the public comment section, you have three minutes. Hey, Mayor Benke, uh, Mike Lewis, I'm sorry. I thought I was muted and unmuted, and so technology uh, not working to. No, the don't best worry of my about ability. it, Mike. We're, we're, we're all so, experiencing the same situation. Yeah. Don't, don't feel Star bad. six, I know that. Uh, <laughs> um, anyways, no, I would just echo Greg's comments, and certainly Carl and myself have spoken uh, throughout the course of the last several years, as have Rebecca and I and, and others. So. Um, I would just echo, echo Greg's support of the roundabout. 
Great, thank you very much, Mike. We appreciate you being here and um, we'll, we will have an opportunity to um, answer questions of the commission as we progress um, through the meeting. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to our city manager, Rebecca Flurry. Rebecca, thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Mayor Benke. I appreciate that. Thank you, Mayor and Vice Mayor and Commissioners for being at this workshop tonight. Um, returning Commissioners will know this is a subject that we've talked about before. Certainly this intersection has been studied even before the time I joined the seat of Battle Creek in 2014. Um, new Commissioners, we hope that you find this presentation helpful. It gives some background information. It talks about the public engagement, community engagement, education that we've done around this particular intersection and the proposed um, roundabout. It has been studied by at least two consultants, traffic safety experts, um, you know, trying any and considering all options for this particular intersection. That has been a challenge for a little while. And um, we, we understand and uh, feel terrible about a recent fatality of that intersection. And it's been um, important for staff uh, to consider all options. And I hope that you find the presentation helpful, but then we have Carl and his team available for questions. So I will turn it over to Carl Fetters, our DPW director. Uh, thank you, Rebecca. And before I get started on the presentation, I, I just want to uh, publicly thank Jessica, our communications manager, because on a normal project, she helps us as engineers communicate to the public and kind of translate from engineer speak to the public speak, but uh, she has put in extra effort on this project and I'm, I'm very appreciative of it. So um, like Rebecca has said, we're here to talk about the intersection of North Ave and Emmett Street. And it's um, one of our busier intersections and, and um, sa several safety concerns that we're trying to address. So just to kind of run down what we're going to be doing tonight, we're gonna, we'll go through our introductions of the team members that have been kind of spearheading the design. We'll talk about what the problem has been out there. We'll go through our history there. We'll talk about the alternatives that we've considered. Um, I'll turn it over to our consultant to kind of talk through the advantages that a roundabout would have at this intersection. We'll talk a little bit about the myths or the questions that we get and the actual facts. And we'll walk through our current status, next steps, and give plenty of time for a question and answer here at the end. Uh, next slide. So as in an introduction, I'm Carl Fetters. I'm the Director of Public Works. And I was going to have our team kind of introduce themselves. So Greg. I'm Greg Rickmar. I'm the city's traffic engineering manager. I'm Darren Campbell. I'm a civil engineer. So Greg Rickmar has 40 plus years of experience with the city of Battle Creek. And Darren probably has the most experience out of everyone that I have on my staff at actually being on site for this intersection. And then uh, Whiteman, uh, Mickey, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Good evening. Uh, my name is Mickey Bittner and I'm a principal engineer and regional director with Whiteman and providing quality control and quality assurance on this project. Aaron, are you on? Well, <laughs> you muted Aaron. How about Melanie? I am here. I saw Aaron on earlier, so I don't know if something happened to his internet or something. Um, I'm Melanie Stanage. I am with Whiteman. I am a senior civil engineer and the uh, designer on this project. Um, and I guess if Aaron's not going to introduce himself, I'll just give a brief intro for Aaron. Um, Aaron's one of our other senior civil engineers, and he is the project manager for this project. I think I'm on now, right? No. Yes. Okay. My computer isn't connecting the video, so I'm um, on my phone. But yeah, I'm Aaron Neatling. I'm the senior project manager for this project. Next slide. All right. So um, the problem 
The problem is that it's a very busy intersection, both for vehicles and pedestrians. Um, the vehicle or the intersection sees about 23,000 vehicles per day, and it is mostly generated by some of the features or some of the um, entities in the, in, the, in the vicinity of the intersection. So north of the intersection is Kellogg, uh, Kellogg Community College, and then on the northeast quadrant is Bronson, and on the southwest quadrant is Irving Park. And then just to the east of this intersection is Fremont International Academy, which had been vacant for a number of years, but has been reintroduced as an, uh, an academy or an international academy and is ramping up to full, um, full enrollment. Um, the other thing that's unique about this intersection is that um, the pedestrian volume is kind of generated from by some off-site parking for Bronson. Um, so there's some parking in the southeast quadrant, and we're trying to safely cross these pedestrians from that quadrant to the, um, the, the northeast quadrant. Um, next slide. So a little bit of the history. Um, in October of 2018 is when we the intersection was uh, the scene of a fatality. But way before that, the city of Battle Creek and Bronson had engaged each other on trying to improve the safety. And even up to that point had made several safety improvements. Uh, but following that accident, uh, the city of Battle Creek hired OHMs, uh, OHM advisors to do a road safety audit. And the definition of a road safety audit there is on the screen. But in essence, what it was is it was like a fresh look. So we brought in people that had never seen the intersection and they reviewed uh, signage, signals, um, safety features, and uh, just functionality of the intersection. And it gave us a fresh pair of eyes to kind of look at it. Um, in December of that same year, we received the final report, which had identified uh, 23 hazards and also had made suggestions on some mitigation efforts that we put into place. Uh, next slide. So from December of 2018 to May of 2019, um, the city's engineering department and signs and signals uh, division uh, made several improvements to the intersection or changes. Um, some big categories have it were that we reduced sign um, clutter. We um, improved the placement of the signs. Uh, we enhanced the pavement markings in the area. We added uh, signal back plates and tethers, which would make the signals a little bit more vis vis visible. Uh, we updated the signal permit, which is the timing of everything that happens at the signal. Uh, and we did that to accommodate, um, you know, pedestrian walking speed and those type of features. And then we also added what's called a leading pedestrian interval. And what that is, is when a pedestrian pushes the push button, they are, uh, they are given an all red phase for a, a small period of time before any green phases start. And that, lead, that gives the pedestrian kind of a head start ahead of the vehicles that, um, that would normally kind of go right in on green uh, with the same time as pedestrian um, green. But those, all those short-term improvements aside, the long-term uh, recommendation was a roundabout. And we started to educate ourselves on roundabouts. We went to seminars, we visited roundabouts in other areas, and we talked to the experts. Next slide. So we identified that the, the road safety audit was conceptual. It was not based on any real hard design. So we reached out to Whiteman and Associates Incorporated in February of 2019 to do a model. And the purpose of that was to make sure that the roundabout uh, would accommodate the traffic and the growth that we would see in the next 20 to 40 years um, with the addition of the Fremont International Academy opening. And so that was done in February. And then in March, when we got results, um, DPW staff committed to pursuing the grants that were gonna be necessary to build this roundabout and to do an educational campaign centered around uh, roundabout safety and roundabout functionality. Next slide. So 
October of 2019, uh, we acquired uh, CMAC funds, and CMAC stands for Congestion Mitigation and Air Quality. It's um, a pot of money that is used for projects uh, aimed at reducing emissions. And because we reduce delay, vehicle delay, uh, will in essence um, reduce emissions at this location. Um, CMAC funds are about quarter million dollars worth of funds that can be used for construction of the project. Uh, June of 2019, we uh, published a frequently asked questions on the website, and which is still, still there and uh, available for the public to look through. And it's a, it's a collection of questions that we've received through the process of public engagement that we've done so far. In July of 2019, we did our city fair demonstration. And this was an opportunity for us to kind of have some fun with it. And we got big wheels from full blast and we let kids kind of tool around on a model uh, chalk roundabout. And it gave us an opportunity to talk to parents at the same time about roundabout safety uh, and the reasons why we're pursuing the roundabout at this location. And then July of 2019, we submitted an application for a safety grant um, with the hopes of getting a large chunk of money for the project. Next slide. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. In September 2019, we taped a Keeping You Informed on Access Vision, uh, which is still available on their website. Uh, again, just answering questions about roundabouts and that sort of thing. Again, uh, this is why I had to thank Jessica to begin with. Uh, this presentation. Um, in March of 2020, the City of Battle Creek kind of was awarded the safety grant that we applied for. Uh, we were awarded $600,000, which is the grant's cap for uh, distribution. And we were told during our award that um, it's a competitive grant and that our grant submittal scored the highest um, in all of the state for that, that fiscal year's uh, submittals. So in June of 2019, and, and maybe I should have put another bullet in there, but after March of 2020, COVID happened and or began. And so it kind of delayed some of the public engagement that we wanted to do, uh, one being NPC engagement. And also uh, we wanted to engage Bronson a little bit more thoroughly, at least with their staff. And that wasn't, we weren't able to do that. So in June of 2020, we entered into a contract with Whiteman uh, and Associates Incorporated to do the design of the roundabout and to help us with all environmental clearances and right-of-way acquisitions. So um, we have been going through that process and in December we put a conceptual design uh, layout of the geometrics to work and we um, we engaged Meyer on Columbia and used their parking lot to kind of test out some of the things, uh, pedestrian crosswalk placement, curb um, arrangement. And we all have heard horror stories about um, an engineer that had built something that a fire truck couldn't roll through. And so we had um, all, um, all a wide range of departments come out to our, our, our demonstration here to see if they can maneuver through our proposed roundabout. So we had you know, a large truck um, come out and go through it. Uh, we had our Battle Creek Transit came out and rolled through the roundabout and we had all of our Traeger winners on the bus. So uh, the city manager, the director of um, transit director and our communications manager on the bus. We had some equipment from our DPW rolled through and then again, we had the fire department. And we were testing um, speed volume or how fast you can actually roll through around the, our roundabout and uh, pedestrian crossing safety. So next slide. And then uh, in, in January of 2021, we received our letter of support from Bronson and um, I'm glad they're on the call. They have been good partners through this project and uh, they will need to be continued to be good partners as we um, move into construction and, uh, and further on. So now I'm going to uh, hand it off to uh, White Men and Associates, and I think Melanie is going to take you through and walk through some of the advantages of a roundabout and why we chose this as a solution here. Yeah, thanks, Carl. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, 
So I just want to start out by just talking kind of about some roundabout basics. I know not everybody is familiar with how roundabouts are intended to operate um, from a vehicular standpoint. So just kind of wanted to touch on that quickly. So the intent of roundabouts is that the vehicles that are in the circulating pattern, which is that circle directly around that big central island, they always have the right of way. So they don't have to yield to anyone. And then all vehicles that are approaching the roundabout um, from any of the four directions are required to yield to the cars that are circulating in the roundabout. Um, so just kind of wanted to touch on that. I know there's not a ton of roundabouts in this area in Michigan. Um, and I know um, hopefully we can do some more education about how to use them and get people more comfortable with them. Um, that's just kind of a real quick basic intro to how they operate. Um, and actually the gentleman on the call earlier that called in for public comment kind of beat me to this, but I wanted to talk about some of the advantages of roundabouts. Um, so in terms of environmental, roundabouts are much more environmentally friendly than signalized intersections. They reduce emissions by reducing the amount of time that vehicles are accelerating and decelerating and also greatly reducing the idle time. So times that cars are just stopped um, at a red light. And this is especially seen in off peak hours. Um, so if you're like me and you're driving in an off peak hour and you're sitting at a red light and there's no cross traffic, it can be a little frustrating because you're like, oh man, I could really go right now. So um, that really helps in those lower volume hours as well because it's a free flowing traffic motion so people are able to just move through the, through the roundabout without having to wait. Um, in terms of operation and maintenance costs, um, roundabouts are also less costly than a signalized intersection. Um, so a couple of points there, obviously, um, as a gentleman stated earlier, they don't require the electricity that um, is required of signalized intersections. They don't require the maintenance of those traffic signals, which can be costly. They also have uh, a, a longer lifespan than a signalized intersection. So a normal lifespan of a roundabout is about 20 to 25 years, whereas for a signalized intersection is about 10 years. Um, and then in general, just in terms of societal costs, there's actually some reduction in general cost due to the reduction of fatal and serious injury related crashes. Um, so next slide. Uh, so in terms of crash severity, so one of the really big selling points on roundabouts is that they are shown to reduce those fatal and injury related crashes. So um, you can kind of see in these graphics here at a typical signalized intersection, you have a lot of different conflict points, including many opportunities for right angle or head on collisions. Um, and with a roundabout and that graphic in the far right, all of those uh, crashes are reduced to side swipes. So a roundabout reduces all 90 degree collisions, which uh, really helps reduce the severity of those crashes. Um, and especially for those related to uh, fatal or serious injuries. And I think studies have shown that those, that reduction for, for people that like numbers is about 60 to 75% for roundabouts in comparison with signalized intersections. Um, and then overall crash reduction is seen at about 35%. So a lot of this is due just to the geometry of the roundabout and how vehicles move through the roundabout. And obviously speeds are also gonna be quite a bit slower. So through this intersection now, um, with the posted speeds being 25, 30 miles an hour, vehicles are going, you know, 25, 30, 35 miles an hour, whereas in this roundabout, we're going to be closer to 15, maybe 20 miles an hour. So it's going to reduce those speeds as well, which is going to reduce the severity of those crashes. Um, I also wanted to touch on pedestrians in roundabout, if you don't mind going back. Thank you. Um, so and obviously another thing we're considering here is the huge volume of pedestrians that we're gonna see and really focusing on pedestrian safety. So for pedestrians, roundabouts are typically safer than signalized intersections for multiple reasons. Um, their risk of being involved in a severe collision is much lower at roundabouts, um, mainly due to the fact that the speeds of the vehicles are much slower. Uh, and I, I saw 
when I was reading earlier that a pedestrian is eight times more likely to die in a crash at a, with a car going 30 miles an hour than they are with a car going 20 miles an hour. So that's a pretty big reduction in um, chance of fatality at, at those speeds. Um, the number of conflict points is also quite a bit lower. So a pedestrian moves through the roundabout. Um, they're able to just kind of assess one lane of traffic at a time. So one of the other features of a roundabout is we have these little refuge islands um, in the splitter islands, which are kind of those little triangle areas you see on the legs there. Um, and that provides just a space for the pedestrian to kind of pause before they have to look uh, the other direction for traffic and they can cross there. So you're really only ever dealing with one direction of traffic at a time, which really makes it a lot safer for the pedestrian. Whereas when you're crossing at a signalized intersection, even if you have the walk signal, you know, you still kind of want to be alert for people running red lights or people making right turns on red or turning left in front of you. So it really reduces those conflict points as well. Um, and then lastly, it just reduces the length um, of, of roadway that they have to cross. So at a signalized intersection, you're looking at, you know, 30 or 40 feet of pavement that you're crossing all lanes at once. Whereas in a roundabout, you're looking at about 15 to 18 feet until you get to that refuge island. Um, so it's a much shorter time that you're exposed um, and just overall safer for the pedestrians. So those are some of the advantages uh, from a safety standpoint of of a roundabout. So I can turn it back over to Carl now, I think, to talk about some myths and facts. Thank, thank you, Melanie. And so when we rolled out the idea of placing a roundabout in at this intersection, um, immediately people kind of uh, looked around our area and like Melanie says, we're, we don't have a ton of roundabouts uh, in Calhoun County. And so they, they wanted to compare this situation to Sprinkle Road, and they wanted to compare it to the roundabout that's located near downtown Marshall. And on this slide, you can kind of see that we've overlaid our geometry of the roundabout on top of those two locations. And the difference, the biggest difference is obviously size, right? So we're trying to control speed by reducing the size of the roundabout. So when we did our demonstration out at the uh, at the Meyer, we had we tried to see what the most comfortable speed was to drive our roundabout. And at 15 miles per hour, you're really starting to teeter on being uncomfortable right, driving on the roundabout. And so that's that's about where we want our our design speed to be. So on Sprinkle, you can see it's just a huge roundabout. It's uh, also multiple lanes because it handles a little bit more traffic and this is just off 94. Um, the the one in Marshall is different because they're trying to cross pedestrians into the center of the circle and we won't be permitting that movement at our roundabout. So you know um, unfortunately we don't really have a good uh, roundabout example that's in operation right now to send people to go look to but these two are not comparable locations. Uh, we also were asked about alternatives. Um, we were asked uh, why we didn't put in a tunnel, for example. And um, we, can't, we can't do a tunnel in this location because groundwater is concerned. So in Irving Park, there's a pond and that's about the, what the ground level or the ground um, water elevation is. And so that's not really a viable option the pedestrian bridge uh, would be an option, but there's aerial um, utilities in the area and there's not grant funding that would be uh, available to us to build bridges. Additionally, we would, we would be uh, uh, required to build these bridges with ADA standards. So those, uh, that means that the, uh, the, the bridges would have to have ramps, which would use up a lot of space. And it's unlikely that people would actually use them. Um, and then the final thing that we've heard, and it's been reported, uh, I think it's M Live does their normal uh, most dangerous intersections in Southwest Michigan, and um, the Sprinkle Roundabout. Um, the last few years have has popped up on that list, and 
um, when you're when you're judging the safety of an intersection, it's difficult to say crash volume somehow equates to safe safety um, because with a roundabout design, um, there's a there's a chance while people are still growing to understand how to function in a roundabout that there may or may be a crash volume increase. What we're really after is a crash severity decrease. So from the graphic that's on the sheet here, you can see that any um, crossing uh, vehicle conflict points that are on the typical intersection on the left are intersections that can lead to higher um, fatality rates or personal injury rates. Um, or uh, conflict points that are either diverging or merging, which are the only type of accidents that are at a roundabout, are typically not uh, considered to be common to have uh, uh, personal injury accidents. So, you know, there's when when you look at those statistics and you say um, this is the most dangerous intersection in the Southwest, um, dig a little deeper into those data that data because it's it it's a little bit misleading. Next slide. So the current status. So we've obviously have gotten very close to uh, a geometric design for the roundabout. There's still some things that we're working out. Uh, one being uh, the, the pedestrian refuge islands locations and access points to adjacent properties. Um, we're on a schedule to uh, have our, uh, what was called a grade inspection or basically an 80% uh, complete package to end up by June 7th. We are aiming to have that in a lot sooner so that our funding is secure. Um, so that's, that's our goal here. Uh, the next step for us and what we'll be handling over the next month will be right-of-way acquisition. So one of the drawbacks to a roundabout is that they require a lot of right-of-way. So all four corners, including Irving Park, will be encroached upon. Um, either we'll need full easements or right-of-way um, agreements or um, a grading permits in order to construct our roundabout. And so we'll be engaging a uh, professional to, to go down that road, but we have identified um, what is the ask and we'll be coming back to commission for approval for those. Uh, the project will be bid in the fall or winter of this year. Uh, the commission will uh, have an opportunity to approve that contract. Uh, but by that point, it's really um, kind of a, a rubber stamp because of the effort that goes in to get it to that point. Um, and then um, the construction will begin in the spring of uh, 2022. Next slide. So the budget, um, I think uh, Mr. Kennefick's math might have been a little off. I used accounting principles here, and maybe I shouldn't have, but anything in a parentheses there is our grant money. So it takes off the bottom line. Um, so we've we've invested some, some money into the road safety audit, some preliminary engineering with the model and some geotechnical um, borings, and obviously the design engineering. We have also um, estimated the construction at about a million dollars and have secured both of our grants and it looks as if the project city expenses will be about $300,000 at the end of the project. And those will be funded out of our capital improvement uh, streets program, which is a combination of Act 51 funds and our street millage fund. Next slide. So our next steps, like I said, we kind of had COVID um, hurt our NPC outreach. So this intersection is on the boundary of MPC2 and MPC4. And we'd like to somehow engage those groups and give a similar presentation as we're giving you now um, so that we can answer any questions since they will likely be the ones that will be using it. And then, like I said, we, we have to start the right away um, you know, easement acquisition. And you can kind of see from, this is a earlier design or geometric layout of our project, but you can kind of see the, how much um, encroachment we'll have on the adjacent property. So Irving Park, uh, Bronson's property on, on the Northeast and Southeast, and then um, a little bit on the 
uh, southeast quadrant. And then complete the design and build the project as our next steps. Next slide. So with that, I will answer any questions that you may have. And this video is um, from our demonstration and it's the viewpoint of a pedestrian um, as cars exit the roundabout. Thank you very much, Carl. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to the commission to ask questions. If they do not have questions, we'll just move to the next commissioner. And we'll start with oh. commissioner, uh, Kathy Wilson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I guess I have a couple questions. Do, what do we know about the pedestrian traffic that's there? Is it primarily Bronson employees or are there others? Do we know that? Oh, um, Darren, do you want to answer that? You might have the most experience on site there. Yeah, over the years, I've done a number of traffic count uh, traffic counts at that intersection, and I found that if I had to guess, probably close to eighty to ninety percent of the pedestrian traffic is um, made up of hospital staffs going uh, between that parking lot uh, across North Avenue and then across Emmett Street to the hospital. Um, uh, I even uh, uh, a couple on a couple of occasions uh, made sure to kind of keep track of how many exactly uh, were hospital workers. So I, I have done studies to pay attention exactly to that point and that point only. Okay, thank you. Um, a question maybe for the engineers around, um, is there any um, data around how long it takes people to grow accustomed to a roundabout? Meaning, are there um, an increased number of crashes expected when it first goes in? Till people get used to it, or is is that? I'm just curious. So we've engaged uh, an engineer in Washtenaw County who has put in a lot of these roundabouts, and and that is true. When these first go in learning curve, um, there is all kinds of public engagement videos, um, and the city of Kalamazoo uh, recently put one in, and it was a. It was a Whiteman design. So they had an opportunity where they opened it up to just a limited number of people before they opened it up to general traffic for people to kind of um, experience it before it went live. And I thank you. I have one more question. Um, should this um, be approved, how long does it take to construct and what happens to the traffic that needs to get through there during that process? Well, that is a question we have not quite answered, but the, the, the easiest, quickest way is to shut down the intersection and the roads leading to it and divert traffic and build the intersection. I'm not real sure if there's going to be another alternative to maintain traffic. Um, so that, that will be something that will, will be the next steps. Okay, thank you. I'd imagine that that would have an impact then on the surrounding neighborhoods if you're looking at Wilno Street and those streets there. So making sure that those neighbors are aware that there might be increased traffic might just be another element we need to pay attention to. That's it. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Kathy. Um, next, uh, Sherry, Commissioner Sherry Sophia. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so Carl and I have had several conversations about this and I thought that the project was kind of dead, but now as I understand it, you're asking us to basically rubber stamp your project. So I have a few questions. Um, 23,000 vehicles per day. I'm assuming that there's data that you can share with us regarding um, flow, traffic flow, like you know, when I go through there, um, there aren't generally a lot of people uh, trying to get through that intersection. So it's specific times when there's a lot of traffic. So I'd like to see that data. And then I think Darren, you talked about the um, pedestrian data. I'd like to see that as well. So if you could share that with us. Um, police department, how many tickets have we issued at that intersection? If it is so dangerous, how many tickets are being issued by the police department to people who are driving in a manner that is dangerous to other vehicles or pedestrians? And then what are the plans for, uh, I think Commissioner Wilson touched on this, 
the plans for the traffic that will be diverted into the neighborhoods because people choose to avoid driving through that intersection because they don't want to deal with the roundabout because they can't figure out how to use it. Um, you know, living three blocks from that intersection, um, I frequently go through there and I can tell you as a pedestrian, I feel a whole lot safer crossing that road the way it is now than I will as a roundabout. Um, um, I'm interested in the, the um, growth that's projected. Carl, you referenced that this roundabout will take us you know, 25 to 40 years into the future and the projected growth. I, I'm interested in that data. Um, let's see. Oh, who's gonna be responsible for taking care of that? It looks like green space in the middle, but then I'm confused because you're talking about how we're going to, people won't be allowed to go into that center space on the roundabout. So I'm not sure how you stop that. I, I, that's, I, I, I guess I, I can't get my mind around that. Um, and then who's gonna be responsible for taking care of that? Um, how many crashes happen there, um, either pedestri with pedestrians or with vehicles um, in a typical year? And I'm not talking last year because traffic counts were down everywhere. People just weren't driving. A lot of people were working from home. So, and I understand that they weren't people at the hospital, but kids, uh, North Avenue, you can tell when school starts because North Avenue becomes very busy um, in a typical year. But obviously with COVID, this has not been typical. Um, and then I think that's it for now. Commissioner, thank you very much. Uh, we'll next go to Commissioner Carla Reynolds. Thank you, uh, Mayor. I have a different outlook on that. I had an agency there on North Avenue, right there next to Buckenberger, and accidents occurred quite frequently. Um, there was busy traffic with the kids who got out of school. You have the hospital employees and just the normal traffic from the college. Um, that's a very busy, and I just live not even a block away from that intersection. So I know um, what I've experienced over the years, sitting right there in my office and hearing crashes and people coming into my office trying to call the police or their family member because they were involved in an accident. So if this is going to slow the accident and make it a safe haven, for our workers at the hospital, our um, uh, frontline workers, I think that's something that we need to look at. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I, and I and I approve. I'm going to approve that. Just so that you know. Thank you very much, Commissioner. We appreciate your comments. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, Commissioner Ward Two, Jenna Morris. Um, so I'm just a little concerned about how we're going to um, facilitate this change, I guess. I've only been a driver for five years myself, and I don't have that much experience with roundabouts. And I'm sure that that's the same consensus with a lot of people who go around that um, intersection. Um, and KCC and Central do the dual enrollment, and I know that a lot of students use that too. So I'm kind of concerned about how we are going to um, help, I guess, the younger generation understand how to use roundabouts. And my other question was, the roundabout seems kind of small um, as far as emergency vehicles. So what are the other cars that are there supposed to do if, say, a fire truck comes through? Mm -hmm. Carl, do you want to answer? Go ahead. Yeah. So the it would getting out of the way of an emergency vehicle would be the same like you would anywhere else. Uh, the only difference would be that these pedestrian islands may make that a little bit. 
the roundabout has the center island in, in this particular roundabout um, will have a green area, but then an outer ring that is mountable. So a truck, a normal car may not get on top of this mountable. It's a smaller circle. Um, a truck like a fire truck or a uh, delivery truck, the, the back end of the truck will kind of trail up onto this thing. So um, that's why we, we, we had the fire apparatus out on our demo to make sure that they were comfortable maneuvering through there and, and they are. Um, uh, getting vehicles to get out of the way of emergency vehicles um, and education will be something that we focus on here in the next um, year really to, to um, educate how a roundabout is supposed to operate. Because the one thing that I have been able to do through the course of this is someone will call me with concerns that a roundabout won't work there. And I will talk through with them. And their biggest concern is that they know how to drive in a roundabout, but everybody else doesn't know how to drive in a roundabout. And so um, we'll have to help to correct that. Okay, next we'll go to Commissioner Jim Lance. Thanks, Mayor. The area where this is intended to go to, how many uh, private landowners do we anticipate uh, having to approach? If any. Um, so really we have four, four locations where we're gonna need easements or grading permits. One will be us in Irving Park. Two of the locations are owned by Bronson. And the final location is on that southeast corner and, and that will be a grading permit, which isn't uh, a permanent easement. So in terms of the private landowners, I'm guessing that if they refuse to grant us this, as the city will have to uh, assert eminent domain? Well, we've we've already engaged with Bronson and, and they are a willing partner. Uh, the city of Battle Creek obviously um, is, it will be your decision. And then the Southeast corner, if the, if the landowner is unwilling to, to work with us, um, we probably have some options to avoid that um, eminent domain situation. You know, obviously <clears throat> the, the safety concerns are, are evident, but uh, I also look at whether as a government we're going to trample on property owner rights and, and individual rights because, you know, what stops us if we take this area to go somewhere else as well. So uh, uh, I, I would uh, I appreciate you uh, answering that. That's all I have, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Lance. Uh, Commissioner Bonica Herring. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I've heard a lot of concerns. Um, I actually just bought a house two years ago to this day on that block. And I walk that block with my dog several times a day. And there are certain times of the day where people fly down this street doing not 30, doing 50 plus. You know, I, I watch the pedestrians that come down this sidewalk and a lot of them are children and a lot of them cross North Avenue to come to Fremont Academy. And sometimes they are not accompanied by parents. My concern is that this intersect, this roundabout is going to be confusing for a lot of people, but with the million dollar cost, one of the community members asked, why is it not a better idea for Bronson to build a parking garage if that's what we're concerned about is the pedestrian traffic? Because a lot of that, a majority of that traffic is nurses and a lot of them don't come across at that intersection. They cross at the truck entry to the back of the cancer care center and they come across and they just risk coming in traffic instead of going to the crosswalk. So has Bronson been asked about building a parking garage because they have the space because that would keep out a lot of the pedestrians that are using that intersection because that is a dangerous intersection. And even with the lights and the walk signals and the buttons that you push, that is a horrible intersection to be a pedestrian in. And, I, and I'm 42, I can't imagine the little kids that cross it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner. 
Um, Carl, are there any responses to Commissioner Perry? Yeah, I'm not sure if I can speak for Bronson at this point, but um, you know, you're talking about a million dollars for a roundabout, or I'm not even sure what a parking structure would cost. But um, and I see Mike Lewis. Maybe maybe if the mayor would. Yeah, let's hear from Mike. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. You know, years ago, we looked at the, the cost of a parking structure. And at that time, uh, I think the cost was about $5,000 per parking space. And I believe that cost has significantly jumped up there. Now it might be ten to $15,000 per parking space. And I've also, you know, with, with the soil bearing borings, excuse me, that we've done, uh, I just don't think it would the soil in that area would support that type of structure. Not to mention we are landlocked. So, you know, we'd have to build that on existing parking structure, excuse, excuse me, existing parking spaces. And yeah, I, I just don't think that's a suitable option for, for Bronson. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Carl. Um, Bonica, did you have any other questions or are you satisfied? No, I'm fine. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Vice Mayor Ferris. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I want to piggyback on what Commissioner Herring said about speeding. Cars just zip down both Emmett and North Avenue right there. Um, and having a daughter that formerly attended Fremont, I can tell you that I did not enjoy crossing that street because traffic was going so fast and um, that a roundabout will not only be slowing down traffic that's just there in the circle, but it's also going to slow down the traffic that's entering into our neighborhood, which I think is great. Um, also, I wanted to touch on, you know, it, it's going to be, you know, we, we've gotten the estimate that it's 80 to 90 percent Bronson staff that are the pedestrians crossing there. But I just want to remind everybody that 100 percent of those people are working in our community and have jobs in our community and are spending money in our community. So I think it's besides the fact that they're humans and we need to be cautious of their health and safety. These are folks that we need to take care of because they're helping to take care of our community. Um, I had a question about the MPC engagement. Can you tell me, Carl, what what engagement was completed before COVID lockdown? Because I know that there was some outreach and that there were a couple workshops. Um, so, so how much has been given out to the MPCs and how much more work needs to be done? So, well, really we haven't engaged the NPCs at all formally on this. Obviously we've done other avenues. So we did the access vision and we did city fair and the frequently asked questions, um, but we we're hoping. I'm not sure if maybe we can schedule a virtual meeting. I'm not sure if they have formally met since COVID had started, but um, we do need to engage those two NPCs. Um, I think that's really where our educational campaign needs to start, um, and and that's 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 what our job will be here this summer and going into next year, so. So I would just suggest that, um, I, I'm trying to think of creative ways to reach people while they're not meeting, because it is hard to have a Zoom meeting with that many people and Open Meetings Act. Um, so I guess just informational wise, we, we have lists of the members, make sure that we are able to email these this presentation or um, email or even just snail mail them uh, information and links to our website so that they can see exactly what we're talking about and see some of these statistics. Um, I think that's really important that we do as much as we can, um, you know, uh, offline or I'm sorry, online. And um, I'm trying to think what was the last thing that I wanted to ask about. I was just going to say that, like, in, in general, I think that the learning curve is just going to be the biggest thing and that the, the more education we can get out to the community to help um, them to learn how to use a roundabout, the better. Um, maybe have a couple more of these full size demonstrations set up, um, maybe even partner with KCC so that it's closer um, to the site so that people that actually use it on a daily basis can stop by and, and just see how it works. Um, 
you know, roundabouts like this are used all over the place. My family uh, was lucky enough to go to Ireland a while back and um, they're everywhere, absolutely everywhere. And um, it was a little bit tricky at first to do them on the wrong side of the road and going backwards, but um, we got used to it. And I know that our community is smart enough to get used to this too. And that it'll benefit all of us. So thank you for your hard work that you've put into this. And thank you for the amount of engagement that you've done, even with the Corona shutdown, it's much appreciated. Thank you for your nice remarks, uh, Vice Mayor. Uh, Commissioner from Ward 1, uh, Kristen Blood, please. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I think every commissioner has echoed a question that I've had, so I don't want to take up any more time. Um, I, I look forward to seeing the data that Commissioner Sophia asked for. I appreciate the um, shared personal stories that um, Herring and Ferris uh, had offered up. So thank you, everyone, for the great questions and the great presentation, um, Carl, and if your staff and uh, yeah, so thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, I too um, will take that approach. Um, if there's any ward in the city that can handle it, I think it's Ward 3 or Ward 2. I'm not sure where the line is, but um, I think our public uh, perception or the way that we went over the support of these two wards is going to be very critical. And um, I would whatever you had planned on doing, Carl, I would double your efforts because speaking from experience, we had two traffic uh, issues in Ward 3 that we dealt with years ago. One was called Max Ferris Folly, and the other one dealt with a roadblock that we put in on Sherman and Orchard that utterly failed. Both of them just really failed, and we got beat up pretty bad as a commission, but uh, I'm aging myself. Um, with that. I'm sure you can find some notes on that, but it, it, we really got beat up. But um, I can support this. I think it's innovative. I think it's something that we need on the north side of Battle Creek. That is a very dangerous intersection. I avoid it, especially um, like after 2.30 in the afternoon till 5 or 6. Um, it'll settle down after 6, but it, it's a busy um, place. And, you know, the Federal Center um, used to dump a lot of people out and um, everyone's heading out towards Emmett Township. Um, so um, I want to thank the commission um, for asking some very pointed questions of Carl um, and his staff and the engineers and consultants. Um, would anyone else like to say anything that they didn't say before, before we take a break until seven? I just want to say thank you to Carl. I appreciate you reaching out and um, getting this information out. I also think that maybe possibly um, since um, the shopper goes to a lot of the, the um, residents, I think maybe something like that in the shopper would give people a, head up, a heads up as to you know what's happening if they haven't already heard and kind of like a diagram just to give them a heads up as to what's coming. I think that would be. Thank you, Carl. Okay, I wanna thank everyone again. We're gonna take a break or we'll probably just sign off, I'll make it easier. And we'll uh, see you um, in a little while on, on Zoom. <laughs>